What made Simon Peter stand out from the other disciples? Why did Jesus choose a flawed fisherman like Peter to lead his church? Could you see yourself in Simon Peter's struggles and transformations? We're going to answer all of those questions and more. We're also going to do a character profile on Simon Peter. Look at the moment that Jesus called him to follow him. And then we're going to talk about his life after Jesus's ascension and of course his demise. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Autumn, where I make content to change the world through faith driven and brave conversations. This video is a part of a series that I started called the Disciples of Christ, where I do deep dives into the lives of the 12 men that Jesus chose to follow him while he was here on earth. If that's something you're interested in, make sure that you like, share, hit that subscribe button, and make sure you hit that notification bell as well so that you don't miss out on a single episode and story. Let's get into it. All right, so there are several variations of Simon Peter's name. Um, let's start off with the Hebrew version. So the first Hebrew form of Simon's name is actually Simeon bar Jonah. And this just translates as Simon, son of John. John is their father, uh, Andrew's and Simon Peter's father. And he's not really mentioned in the Bible, but that was his name. The Greek form of Simeon is Simon. And Simon is the name that he probably went by the most since he had dealings with the Gentiles. Gentiles is the name that is used for people who weren't born of the Jewish heritage. So it was probably best for him to go by Simon, the Greek form, since most of, most of the people, most of the Gentiles spoke Greek. And of course, there's also Peter. Peter is from the Greek word Petros. Now, Peter was a name given to Peter by Jesus. And you can actually see this moment both recorded in John and in Matthew. In John 1 verse 42, John um, kind of explains it in a way that Jesus gave Peter his name, Peter, um, at, at the first interaction that he had with him. And then Matthew actually records Peter, Peter's name change after Peter uh, declares that Jesus is the true Messiah. There's some debate with scholars about when exactly this name change occurred. I'm not finna get into all that because, you know, at the end of the day, the man's name was changed. But I do want to note that I stated this before in a previous video, which you can click. If you were interested in that video, you can click on um, the link up there. Watch this first, of course, and then come, you know, and then go watch it anyway. Um, but anyway, I stated in that last video that anytime God changes, changes the name of someone in the Bible, it usually signified that that um, person is stepping into the character, stepping into the role, the dynasty um, that God gave them, that God created them for. By changing Simon's name to Peter, Jesus was basically signaling to Peter that, hey, you are about to be a leader in the foundation of the early church. Peter's new name means rock or stone. It symbolizes that he was strong stable and that he was foundational in building the early christian church you might also see simon being referred to as cephas cephas i'll put the actual spelling of the word i'm not i'm, I'm gonna butcher a lot of words okay in this series um i'm gonna try my best but okay listen i don't speak greek hebrew aramaic so just bear with me that is the aramaic form of peter's name it just means rock and stone peter was raised in a bilingual galilee um to be more specific he was raised in Bethsaida with along with his brother Andrew he later moved and lived in Capernaum um, with his wife and potentially his mother-in-law um, Jesus actually heals Peter's mother-in-law you can actually read that recorded in one of the gospels and so it's indicating that maybe she lived with them during that time which is pre pretty typical during that time this is also where he worked as a fisherman alongside his brother um, some scholars say that this is the locate um, that their father John's or Jonah's fisherman business was located in Capernaum. And so Andrew and Peter moved to Capernaum to be as stand in managers while their father stayed in Bethsaida. Um, this actually makes a lot more sense since the sons usually just took on the trade of the fathers. And so it makes a lot of sense if he sent his two sons to be manager and just, you know, manage things while he was because he didn't live in Capernaum and that was where they're stationed. It's also worthy to note that fishermen were not considered high society men <laughs> um, that term is used a lot today but they were not considered high status um, this position was very lowly um, even though they were important for the the economy because they you know they brought in the high value fish and everything and they worked in the trade marketplace and trading and stuff 
this was still not considered, you know, one of the highest level of society. Jews and Galilee were looked down upon by Jews that lived in Jerusalem and the surrounding area around Jerusalem. Um, Judean Jews looked at Galilean Jews as unsophisticated, rustic, ghetto. <laughs> this is actually recorded, actually, you can actually see this interaction in the book of Acts. Um, I believe it's Acts chapter 4, verse 13, where Peter and John heals a man outside of the temple. And when they were brought before the Sanhedrin, which the Sanhedrin was just the, the Jewish ruling council during that time, uh, it was filled with, you know, um, educated religious leaders. Um, they were astonished and amazed by Peter and John's bold speech and the way they carried themselves because they knew that Peter and John was from Galilee and then they knew they looked at Galileans as like uneducated, you know, didn't really know, probably didn't know how to speak, didn't know how to write and just weren't really sophisticated. So they were amazed when they saw that Peter and John were speaking so boldly and so smartly as they, <laughs> if, if that's a word. Positive personality traits about Peter was that he was brave. He was loyal. He was humble. He was passionate okay peter was down for jesus peter was that ride or die dude he was ready to pop off at any moment if he saw if he saw any sign of respect he was down for jesus okay he was ready to die put it on the line for jesus he was about that life you know let me let me stop but yeah he was just very passionate now he did have some negative he did have some negative traits one of them being that he was very impulsive and emotional meaning that he acted and he spoke without thinking at times um, he didn't really read the room. He was just ready to pop off. And you actually see this in his encounter um, when they were trying to take Jesus away to be crucified. He just took that knife and cut off their ear. No questions asked. He was no questions asked. And Jesus was like, yo, you need to chill out. Like you need to calm down. You're here. You need to bring it down here. OK. Um, and so, yeah, that is actually the culture of people who lived in Galilee at that time. They're very fiery and passionate about their traditions and their culture and their faith. And so it actually makes sense that he was this way as well. Um, I actually, I actually think that being impulsive is a negative, but it also can be a positive at times. Like again, he was right or die. Those people are rare. <laughs> now let's dive deep into Jesus calling of Peter. Now, when Jesus called uh, Peter to follow him, this is actually recorded in all four of the gospels. Um, like I stated in the previous video, I think it's imperative that you Take a moment from the Bible from one gospel and you compare it to the other three. It really gives you a big, broad picture of probably what how that scene looked. And um, it just gives you more clarity of that moment. Um, so Matthew and Mark, they take a more like a mission approach to Jesus's calling to, of Peter. Um, they really focus on the mission that Jesus was trying to portray to his disciples in that moment. John takes on a more um, destiny approach with his with his uh, recording of this moment. He really focuses on Jesus's destiny for the disciples. And then Luke takes on a more human personal side. He really focuses on the human reaction um, to when Jesus calls the disciples. So I actually want to go and focus on Luke's version because I feel like that is more relatable, or at least I relate more to it. And um, it just highlights a lot about the human condition when we first encounter Jesus or when Jesus calls us to be the person that he made us to be. And so that is what we're going to focus on. If you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Are you there? Good. Okay, here we go. All right. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, Gennesaret, we're going with it, we're going with it, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And put out a little from the land just means that he asked Simon if he could swim sail out away from the land a little bit um this was pro he probably asked him this because a lot of people were crowding around him as he was preaching and you know some people was probably asking him to speak up then you got the babies crying in the back then you got all these people chattering that they thinking they whispering but they really not you know what i'm just getting all into it you know i have some ptsd from my public speaking days anyway that's beside the point um, but yeah, so he just asked Simon, like, hey, swim out a little bit so that people can hear me and that I can see everybody's beautiful faces. <laughs> and he sat down 
and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered him and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. So both the boats are sinking at this point. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Forsook all just means they just left everything behind and they followed Jesus. They were like, look, I don't care about anybody else in this moment. I don't care about anything in this moment. Forget these boats. We about to go. We about to. Oh, let me stop. Okay. So that is Luke's recording of this moment. And again, I just want to deep dive into it because I want to really focus on Peter's response to Jesus's miracle you know Jesus performed this miracle and to give you a little context like these men were fishermen they fished all their lives um this is not their first rodeo they've been doing this from the get-go okay and to have a night of no fish when you've been basically working all night they probably were stressed out because no fish means no money if you have no money how are you gonna feed your family that night fish was the bread and butter and so they didn't have any any fish that night. They didn't catch anything. So they're probably frustrated, physically exhausted, because, of course, it's all through the night. Um, and then they have to go home and explain to their wives, like, why we ain't got no food tonight? And then they're going to be like, well, we, we did the work. And then it's going to, you know, what? I, I kind of go on like little tangents. And then again, I stated in the previous video, Andrew, of course, um, was probably talking up Jesus already to Simon Peter. Andrew came to Simon Peter and was like, we have found the Messiah. Now, you have to put yourself in that situation. It was probably many people before Jesus that were claiming to be the Messiah. The Jewish people were waiting for the Messiah to come and redeem them. They were under Roman um, occupation during that time, so there was a lot of political tension. And so they were just waiting for their Messiah to come and rescue them under the Roman thumb. Um, and so they probably had many people, you know, claiming to be the Messiah, the person to rescue rescue them from the Romans. And, and of course, those people weren't the Messiah. So then, you know, a lot of Jewish people are probably discouraged, a little hesitant to just jump on the bandwagon that, you know, you found the Messiah. But in this case, it was actually true. And Jesus proved that with his miracle. And so then we have a moment where Peter realizes it's the divinity of Jesus Christ in that moment. He realizes that this man is the Messiah, that this man is not merely a human, that this man was sent to earth to save the Jewish people. He was saved. He was sent to earth to save all people. But at the time, the Jews were just thought, you know, he's came to save us from the, from, from the Romans. And what's interesting about Peter's response is that instead of, you know, rejoicing and focusing on the fact that he has met the Messiah and that he is in the presence of the Messiah, he instantly looks internally into himself and realizes his unworthiness, realizes his sinfulness. His immediate instinct was to fall to his knees and confess his sins. This is actually a pretty common response when people encounter God's holiness. If you go back to Isaiah chapter six and verse five, when he had a vision of God's holiness, um, he actually, his first response to that was, woe to me, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips. This is similar with Peter's encounters with Jesus' divine power and authority where Peter recognizes his own unworthiness. And Peter probably didn't expect Jesus, of all people, the Messiah, to be speaking to a mere fisherman. Again, I said the fishermen were looked down upon. They weren't really high status. So for Peter, this is actually pretty amazing. This is an amazing moment. Like, the Messiah is taking the time to talk to someone as unworthy as me. The miraculous catch that they had with the fishes in the net shattered Peter's preconceived notions of Jesus and the Messiah. And it really just put honed in on the, on Peter's human limitations. Peter basically recognized that he falls short in the glory of God. And you can actually, that's a verse in the Bible. 
Um, many of us, when we have that encounter with Jesus, we see that we do fall short in the glory of God. And Peter could not help but feel unworthy in his presence. But then look at Jesus's response to Peter's um, his his exclamation of unworthiness. Jesus says, do not be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. This is very significant because Jesus doesn't condemn Peter. He doesn't distance himself from him, from Peter. He doesn't say, oh my God, you are filth. You need to get away from me. He, instead, he reassures Peter with the words, don't be afraid. Despite Peter being aware that he is unworthy to be at the feet of Jesus, Jesus opens up his arms, gives Peter grace and encourages a closer relationship and encounter with him. Instead of rejecting Peter's humility and his confession, Jesus embraces it and transforms it into a calling. This just shows the grace of Jesus and how he sees potential. He doesn't see your state and when you come to him, you can come as you are. He sees the true, your true identity, the person that he created you to be. And so he will always have open arms in whatever state that you come to him in. Also, he gave Peter a purpose. Many times people are looking for a purpose. They're looking for a promise. They're looking for, you know, what is the significance of their life? And Jesus gives you that once you confess yourself to him and you decide to follow him in that moment. In this moment, Peter was transformed from an earthly occupation of a fisherman to becoming a pillar of the early Christian church. Jesus doesn't wait for Peter to become perfect before putting him in position before calling him to lead the church, to become a leader, to become what he created him to be. And it's the same thing with us. Jesus doesn't want you. He doesn't wait for you to come to become perfect. In fact, you cannot be as perfect as Jesus. We can only strive to be perfect. And it's through his grace that we come out on top of our mistakes of our unworthiness. This moment also just shows that Jesus Jesus' power over the natural world. Jesus is above the, the earthly realm. He is the divine. He has the authority. He has the power. He is the authority over creation. He transformed lives just with his grace and with his presence. Peter's reaction also reminds us just of the universal human condition. When we encounter God's holiness, we recognize our unworthiness. And in turn, we also recognize our deep need for his grace. We recognize that we cannot get through this life without his grace and his love and his mercy. Jesus' response to Peter shows that God's grace is not limited to humans' worthiness. Instead, it overcomes it and it calls us to be in deeper, closer connection to him. This passage is a reminder to us that God's call is not dependent on our worthiness, but on his grace. Just as he called Peter, he calls us despite our imperfections, transforming us through his power and through his purpose. And even after Jesus calls Peter to be a leader in the church and to follow him and, you know, and to preach and the good word and all that, Peter still had a lot of failures. I mean, we can go down the list. There's the walking on the water in Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 through 31. You know, he Peter demonstrated some great faith in the beginning when he was walking on water. He was focusing on Jesus, but then he got dismayed by the winds and the waves. He got distracted and then his heart started to fill with fear and doubt. And then he started to sink. And of course he calls out for Jesus to save him, to help him. And that's what Jesus does because that he's Jesus. And even Jesus kind of rebukes him in the moment and says, ye of little faith. This just shows the grace of God when our faith wavers. Then there's also the part, the, the moment where Peter rebukes Jesus after Jesus tells him that he's going to be taken away to be crucified. Peter kind of checks Jesus a little bit and he's just like, whoa, look, that, that cannot happen. Okay, that's not happening. All right. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Okay. Because Jesus was on a mission. That moment just shows Peter's lack of understanding of Jesus's mission at that moment. Jesus was more concerned about God's salvation of his people. This failure just really indicates Peter's misguided pride in that moment. There's also many other mistakes. I'll list them out here on the, sc on the screen. There's a transfiguration in Peter's misstep. Um, I think that's in Luke chapter 9, 28, ver verses 28 through 36. And then there's Peter's denial of Jesus, of course. And then there's him falling asleep at the um, at Gethsemane when Jesus asks Peter, James, and John to just, you know, wet, watch and pray with him in the moments before he is about to be taken, be crucified. And he comes back three times, y'all. Three times to find them sleeping. The second time he came back, Peter, Peter knew, Peter, James, and John knew they were in the wrong they they looked at him and they didn't even know what to say to the man he was just like are y'all still sleeping he said peter are you sleeping
Anyway, that's a whole lot. of You can read that in Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 41. And then you can even see it after Jesus ascended into, into heaven and he gave the disciples the Holy Spirit to preach his good word. You can actually see that Peter still has some some moments of failure. Paul called him out to be a hypocrite up in Antioch. You can read that in Galatians uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. It's actually one of my favorite moments of the, in the Bible with the Paul and Peter, but yeah, you read it. We can actually learn lessons from Peter's weakness, and it just shows us like the human condition and the transformative grace of God. Peter's failures remind us that the most devoted Christians can still have moments of doubt, fear, um, moments where their faith has wavered, and moments where we make mistakes. This is the moments where our humanity is fully on display. But despite Peter's failures, Jesus continually gives him grace. Jesus continually builds him up to be the leader of his church once he ascends into heaven. Even after Peter denied him three times, Jesus in that moment, despite Peter's denial, still saw potential in Peter, still had love for Peter and gave him that grace and continued to tell him that you are called for greater purposes, for greater works despite your mistakes, despite your failures. And one thing, Peter's failures demonstrate that failure is not the end. Look how many times Peter failed. Look at all the mistakes he made. And yet Jesus continued to give him grace. Jesus continued to remind him of his calling. Jesus continued to put him on a platform where he was going to be a leader. And eventually Peter got the message and he became that leader for the church. Now let's get into life after Jesus' ascension and we're going to talk about Peter's death. Why did I smile at that moment? That was weird. Cut that out. All right. So after Jesus, you know, got on the cloud and ascended into heaven and left us the Holy Spirit, period. Peter became one of the central figures of the early Christian church. You can actually read a lot about his acts in the book of Acts of the Apostles or whatever version your Bible calls it. Um, you can read a lot about his preaching and, you know, the miracles he performed after Jesus ascended into heaven. Um, and then you can also just read his two epistles that he wrote, first and second Peter, where you can further dive deep into his teachings and see him encourage people of the faith. However, what it doesn't talk about is the areas that he preached in. Some scholars say that he preached mostly in Antioch, Corinth, and eventually in Rome. And this is where he met his demise. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Peter was martyred in Rome during the reign of Emperor Nero around 64, 67 AD. Nero wasn't famous for his persecution of Christians. Um, in fact, you can actually read about the Great Fire of Rome, which happened in 64 AD, where he blamed the Christians for the fire. And then that caused a mass execution of Christians all over the region. If you want to dive more deep into that, I'm pretty sure there's probably some documentary about it or on Netflix or whatever you get your documentaries. And I'm pretty sure it's probably in some history book somewhere, but I'm not going to dive deep into that. Tradition holds that Peter was crucified just, just like Jesus was in Rome. But however, he asked to be crucified upside down because he did not want to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus because he believed himself to be unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus which actually correlates with how he reacted when he first encountered Jesus and realized that Jesus was the Messiah. He instantly noticed his, um, his unworthiness. And so this actually him requesting to be crucified un upside down because he didn't think he was worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus actually kind of correlates. And so I believe it, but again, this is outside of scripture. Anything outside of scripture should be tested and bested in my, that's what I tell myself. This tradition was first mentioned by Oregon um, or origin again, names y'all places, not my strong suit. I'll put the spelling out on the screen. But this was first mentioned by him. Um, he was a Christian scholar in the third century. That is 201 AD, all the and beyond. And it was later confirmed by further early Christian writers. Origen wrote about Peter. This is what he wrote. He said, Peter, at last having come to Rome, was crucified head downwards, for he had requested that he might suffer in this way. After Peter was martyred, it is believed that he was buried in Rome. In fact, the Vatican claims that they have the bones of Peter um, underneath the St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican City. Um, not going to dive into that flex. Just know that. It, uh, is it a flex? Uh, I don't know. This tomb was discovered in the mid 20th century. And now St. Peter's Basilica is uh, acting as a monument for Peter's role in the early Christian church. Overall, Peter's failures are relatable to us. 
um it just shows us that god uses imperfect people to accomplish his his divine purpose you don't have to come to him correct okay <laughs> you don't have to come to him perfect you don't have to come to him pretending to be perfect come as you are confess realize that you are unworthy to be in the presence of God, but then accept his grace and his love and his mercy and let his transformative power and grace and love work through you. And you can work miracles as Peter did. With that being said, I am curious, why did Jesus choose Andrew? Why is he called the first disciple? You can actually find the answers to those questions in this video that I did. Um, make sure you click and watch that subscribe and hit that notification bell again so that you don't miss out on a single story on a single disciple and that you can keep up with this series in this description box below is a link to all the resources I use to create these episodes and if you want to do a deeper dive into the lives of the disciples I will continuously be adding resources to this list again anything outside of scripture should be tested and bested I'll see you guys next Friday, where we'll be talking about the disciple Philip. And my final words to you, let God do his part. Peace.